Well, generally, I don't believe pagans are on our side. Uh, for anyone to argue that uh, Christianity is Jewish in the same sense that my neighbor, Mr. Uh, Lieberstein, is Jewish, uh, is, is, is a moron. Uh, it, it can't be sustained. The, the entire purpose of the Jew in the Western world is to destroy Christianity, and they care about absolutely nothing else. Um, and it's condemned viciously in the Talmud and in all Jewish writings. Um, the term for, for the resurrection is, is Pashka, uh, as you mentioned, uh, which is both uh, Hebraic and, and Greek. Keep in mind that, that Christianity initially was, was not even in Hebrew, was not in Aramaic, uh, but in Greek. The, the first New Testament was in Greek. The first, the church fathers were in Greek. The, the, um, the canons were all in Greek. Um, Nazareth in, in Galilee was surrounded by Greek cities. It was a Greek area. Uh, Christ obviously spoke Latin if he could speak with with Pontius Pilate. Um, this was this was uh, this was a Greek religion at first, not a, not a Hebraic one. Um, uh, these people are often so stupid they don't realize that that Greece stretched far into North Africa and uh, deep into the Middle East at the time uh, before the invasion of, of Islam, um, and and they forget about that. Europe was much larger than it is today. Uh, through the Greek, uh, Greek and, and to some extent Latin influences in North Africa and the Middle East, um, but there were, you know, Nazareth is surrounded by Greek cities, and that was the, the language of, of Nazareth, at least at the elite levels, uh, was Greek. Uh, and the Galilee was completely outside of the, the Jerusalem um, uh, Pharisaical mentality. All of early Christianity was was Greek, later uh, Latin. Uh, Augustine being the first major Latin writer. The, the problem there was that that Latin is far less. Uh, versatile than Greek. It had a less uh, lesser vocabulary than, than Greek for, for complicated ideas. Uh, so that's where Pashka comes from. Um, uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, the, the, one of the weakest arguments that the, these people have is that different, you know, pagan deities um, were used for the story of, of Christ. Um, I've been through them all a thousand times. They're absolutely ridiculous. But part of the problem is, is that um, there's very, very little that we know about uh, the pagan world in Northern Europe. Uh, it wasn't a literate society. We know very, very little about it. What little we know about it comes from the church. Um, so these festivals and these names and everything else is, um, uh, is completely uh, speculative. Uh, there is no Ostara, which is where this Easter is allegedly supposed to come from. Um, the, 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 best, the best theory as to where the word Easter comes from is from the old German. Um, that means dawn. Um, or um, even though there's no theory that it comes from the Latin in albis, which is, you know, for Passion Week, uh, or in white, uh, which is the origin of the term. Uh, they're far better than, than this uh, Ostara that no one ever seems to mention in Northern Europe. But, of course, no one could mention it in Northern Europe under the pagan times because they're, they're, they weren't literate, um, with, with very few exceptions. Uh, you know, um, I have a paper coming out now, uh, Paganism was not a religion. This was a, a cultural way of, of understanding the world around them. It had no doctrine. It had no creed. It had no heretics. Um, it, it didn't, you know, if, if paganism is religion, then, then, then so is Platonism, so is Hegelianism, and so is the average football fan. Uh, so uh, that's really what it, is. it would be like. It would be like a, an anthropologist 100 years from now uh, trying to pretend that the football hooligans were, were, um, were uh, part of a religious ceremony because they had such veneration for, for the team. Um, it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, they have rituals. They have they have uh, even almost liturgical forms of, of veneration for their favorites. Uh, rock stars do the same thing. Rock fans do the same thing. So um, it, it's really it's really stupid. Um, paganism. I don't know what paganism is, and and I've never I never heard a good definition of the term. Um, it's just uh, but but it is it's essentially it's a secular cultural uh, uh, anthropology, having nothing to do with with religion whatsoever. Uh, and certainly in Northern Europe. Um, you know, when, when, when Gregory I sent St. Augustine into, into Britain, he said very explicitly that all the native customs that you see, uh, you retain them, except for those that blatantly contradict the faith, which are very few. And there was nothing wrong with it. It was not seen as, as a religion. It was seen as just local custom. Uh, the concept of, of, of paganism as religion actually came from Christians who wanted to kind of organize this, this uh, foreign pagan idea into some kind of theology that they could fight. And uh, but they had no conception of it. It was simply the day-to-day -day customs of the land, most of which was was healthy and solid. Um, 
paganism can't be compared to Christianity, can only be compared to, to any other philosophy, uh, any other culture in the world. topic today is something that I've been theorizing about for a very long time, but I've yet to write about. Um, I, um, over the years, I, uh, well, let me, I, I don't remember if I said this or not, but when I first started my doctoral program at Nebraska in January of uh, 1995, I was extremely uh, doubtful in terms of theology. Uh, I knew God existed. The Trinity made logical sense to me, uh, on, you know, in Hegelian terms, or even Augustinian terms. But the divisions among uh, the Christians and even, even Islam bothered me. And I hated the idea that I wasn't certain. And it really did affect me. You know, I lost sleep over it quite literally. So from January of 95 to roughly Thanksgiving of 96, um, I read everything written uh, on, on theology between Christ and roughly 300 AD. I, um, I'm a gifted uh, I, was, I was in a gifted school growing up because I read very, very quickly, so I have a leg up on it there. Uh, I was at a, you know, the University of Nebraska, has um, uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, research library in uh, the Midwest. This is just pre-internet, you know. Um, and, of course, I was um, heavily trained in Plato and Aristotle. You need to know Plato and Aristotle before you can pick these guys up because they assume that you know. So I was in an excellent position to read them, Jewish, pagan, Christian, all sects. That's a lot of material. I um, I lost 40 pounds. My mother thought I was going to die. I was obsessed. I had a girlfriend, I think, at the time who I, I forgot about her. Um, I was absolutely obsessed. Uh, it's never happened before or, or since. I think I've told you guys this, but but it's a very important part of my life. And I want to say it again. Uh, my mother even thought I was I, I gone crazy. And I said, well, if I go crazy, I go crazy. That's My sanity is less important than the truth here, the truth that the entire civilization used to be based on. Not to mention the fact that I was a historian, so this wasn't exactly some eccentric drive, this was right in my field. And I don't even remember what it was, but, but in, in, in mid-November of 96, I closed the book and I said, the Greeks have it right. And I got the first good night's sleep I had in, in, in a long time. And I've never deviated since then. Um, I know that the Orthodox Church is correct. I don't believe it's correct. I know it's correct. I've read things that people don't even know exist. Uh, I've read the entire Talmud. I've read everything. But there is one loose end, um, more than one, but this is one that's that always bothered me, and that's what paganism is. I have never received a competent definition of pagan in my life. There's no pagan creed. There is no pagan a synod, there's no pagan heretics, there's no pagan scriptures. So what the heck is it? People use the term often, but when I ask them what it is, they're all over the place. I found it odd that Greeks allegedly believed in gods that lived on Mount Olympus, even though they could see Mount Olympus from parts in Greece. The fact that we use the term God for both the God in heaven, Yahweh, on the one hand, and you know, Zeus and Hera, on the other, is very unfortunate. It's unfortunate because it gives people the impression that Zeus and Yahweh have anything in common, theologically speaking. They don't. Hesiod, when he wrote his Theogony, did not say that he was, uh, like Muhammad said, a, a, a harbinger of truth, a, a divine, divinely inspired prophet. He said nothing of the kind. He was simply collecting older tradition, and uh, just like Ovid, much later on, uh, systematizing it. These weren't meant to be believed. That's why these stories changed all the time. That's why Rome could bring different gods in from different parts of the, of, of the empire and have it not bother them. This is why it didn't matter. That's why there is no creed, because there was no belief here. It was a purely naturalistic approach to things. And so um, that has to be the case. We use terms like religion and worship uh, very sloppily. You know, I could picture uh, an anthropologist a thousand years from now, if there is such a time, looking back at us and, and saying that they had this religion and they show a, uh, someone in front of a screen rooting for a football team, or that the Statue of Liberty was a goddess, or that saluting the flag before the day starts in school, that this was a liturgical event, and concluding that this was a polytheistic society. 
because of that and all the celebrities and everything else. Well, that's intolerable because that means that the word religion and worship is covering such a massive amount of phenomena that it, it has no definition. So we need to be very careful here. Greeks didn't see Aphrodite in the same sense that Christians look at God the Father. They're not gods in the sense that a, a Muslim will see Allah. Now, there's this whole concept in modernity. I have an article, this is coming out in the Barnes Review soon. Um, the Enlightenment is based on, on many, many axioms. One of them is that history is very easy to understand. Humanity starts off very primitive and ignorant. Slowly but surely, it grows out of its superstition and becomes rational and reasonable. There's always, you know, suits and ladders there, but, but uh, that's the general gist of, of all of history. That means that primitive societies are seen as ignorant. Now, that's simply not the case. Ancient civilizations um, may not have developed um, iPhone, but even on Mount Athos, uh, even modern um, architects and builders wouldn't be able to build the monasteries on the side of the mountain the way that they do. It would be a huge project. The pyramids, as most of you will know, are so perfectly done that they are musical notes. There's the, the blocks are so flat that there's no modern um, on the inside, obviously not the outside. The blocks are so flat that no modern tool could uh, mimic it. You go on and on and on. They did have indoor plumbing. They didn't have a substantial uh, medical establishment. Right in the Psalms in the Old Testament, it says the the, um, the lifespan of a man three score years and ten, and sometimes four score years. So they're saying basically the lifespan of our civilization is between uh, 1680 for a man. The idea that, that everyone died at 45 back then is, is pure mythology. And it's self-interest, clearly. You know, uh, um, the regime sees itself as the, the, um, the vanguard of history. It wasn't just Marxists who said that. Capitalists say that too. Um, so to be primitive, in other words, is to be authoritarian or religious, or what we would call traditionalist in outlook. And the advanced life is urban and, and mobile. So, it, it, you know, to accept the Enlightenment idea of things, you have to accept the notion that ancient peoples were radically inferior to moderns in every way. They knew fewer things, they knew fewer techniques, uh, and they saw the natural order as somehow autonomous and, and, and personalized. Myth was a way that they understood the world, uh, stories that were invented somehow that explained the, these external phenomena that modern science, of course, has understood in a non-personalized way. And we're supposed to be very condescending towards the most poor people. Um, well, that would only be true if the myth would function as a holy text in the same sense as the Quran is to Islam. And so the modern enlightenment type will take all of these phenomena and throw it together in one bin and call it religion. That means anything is a religion. If, 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 um, if um, paganism in, in, in ancient Greece was a religion, then so is the veneration given to the flag. Uh, so is the fanaticism that football fans give to the team or to different celebrities. These also would be religious, and they certainly are liturgical. When you think of a, you know, a musical group, uh, we're in darkness, the, their band is playing, and there's flashing lights, and, and, and these images are constantly being beamed at you. Um, it, is, it is a liturgy. Frank Zappa referred to it as liturgical. But it's based on a very crude form of circular reasoning. The scientific revolutionary defines truth as quantitative. Therefore, society is advanced when it uses science based on quantity. The more society sees things in quantitative terms, it is likely more advanced and sophisticated. Well, the external world is understood according to very strict and rigorous mathematical ideas. On, the other, uh, on one hand, the moral order, strangely enough, is purely internalized and subjective. One of the great weaknesses and weirdness of the, of the modern era that the level of scientific rigor is so intense when it comes to uh, you know, building and, and with a technology and progress. But when it comes to something far more important, that is how we act every day, we don't know anything. It seems odd. In other words, most aspects of human life can be reduced to mathematics, except the most important, except for moral reasoning. Now, the natural order is supposed to be subject to human control, granting the elite great power, but that might have something to do with it. The more power the elite have over the natural world, the less they want to hear moral theorists yelling at them about it. The less they're interested in hearing 
um, about how they should use that power. Um, in a colonial regime like 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 18th century Britain, uh, capitalist industrial world, uh, morals is out of the question. Darwin rules. Darwinism came into existence because the British ruling class in the 19th century needed to justify itself. Ancient Rome could never have, have come up with Darwinian idea. You have to have an industrial uh, society. You have to have a, a capitalist system um, in a very strict sense for, for that to ever develop. It was an amoral doctrine. It simply said, uh, also circular, you know, the person who is stronger is the strongest. And, um, and only that, of course, they also get to, to take the spoils of those that they have defeated. So if you are the Warren Buffett of the day, that's music to your ears. Not only are you doing the right, the right thing, or at least not doing the bad thing, um, you are in accord with nature. So to put it more crudely, the more religious a society is, the less advanced it is, and the more it requires outside intervention to actualize their potential. This is the foundation of colonialism. The modern industrial metaphysic is anomalous, and that there is no inherent meaning or purpose to the world, unless, of course, the scientific mind creates it. Meaning comes from the human mind forcing itself onto this outside world. The odd thing is that they, they postulate a universe uh, based largely on cause and effect, except for them. They can't possibly hold that they and, and their will and their minds. The scientific elite is based on cause and effect. That wouldn't make any sense. There would be no knowledge then. There would be association. Somehow, they have rescued themselves from this circle. Uh, the pentagram is, is the icon of this. The four elements, the four directions of the compass, and the point on top, the elite mind. Now, if this modern narrative is harmed, the entire organization of the Western world has no further purpose. There's nothing special about what we have here. So what I'm going to say here is that the pagan myths are not religious. They're not private preferences that people believed in. They are rather the constitution of ancient societies. They weren't believed as true or false or real or unreal, but they were the expression of the ancient world's very conception of truth that the foundational texts of a society, the intellectuals in Greece and Rome didn't believe, and the Stoics made this very explicit, that there was a, a, a Jupiter controlling things. They didn't believe that. These were archetypes. Gods were always meant to be an expression of society's identity. They were civic expressions. They're gods that were worshipped only in the sense that Superman is worshipped among young Americans. The Statue of Liberty is a goddess in the ancient sense. She might be the expression of the American view of liberty, but not a real woman. The Pledge of Allegiance is not a liturgy, but it is a religious text if we see it from the ancient point of view. The gods are archetypes and symbols of very profound social truths learned from experience. They are not actual people. They didn't worship them in the sense that a Christian will um, uh, worship Jesus or a Muslim will worship Yahweh. That we use the words God and religion and worship and veneration to refer to both phenomenon has destroyed our ability to see ancient societies uh, accurately at all. Um, the use of the term religion has really, really reached absurd levels of elasticity. You know, I, I was brought up to believe Eric Clapton was God. You know, rock concerts are liturgies, but you wouldn't call it a religious uh, experience except in the most in the most uh, creative sense. But then, you know, I read GMA Grube, uh, one of my favorite uh, Plato expositors, and he made a simple comment. He says, quote, the Greek theos and the English word God are by no means synonymous, end, end quote. Thales, for example, used the term theos to refer to any substratum on which the world was founded. So the archetype of water, not literal water, you know, again, he, he didn't believe literal water was the foundation of everything. Thales believed the water as, a, as, a, uh, as an archetype. But he referred to it as theos. He didn't say it was a god, but that's the word he used. And the ancients had a tendency to personalize scientific ideas, civic ideas. That doesn't make it a religion. B.B. Uh, King's guitar Lucille would then be a god, if this is how we're going to define it. B.B. did not believe his guitar was a person. Playing it with feeling is not a form of religious devotion, and neither are the fans when they put pictures of it on their walls and treat it with great respect. Olympus was visible from many Greek cities. They didn't say anything up there. That's not the point. The only thing that keeps modern scholars from making this elementary distinction is the prejudice that ancients were primitive, and hence they were apt to believe these tales is literally true. If this prejudice is dismissed, 
then this would be seen as civic forms of self-expression, not religious liturgies. So when a middle-aged contra-goer says Eric Clapton is God, they're just being enthusiastic, not religious. But Eric Clapton being God is very similar to how the ancients would view um, uh, their gods and goddesses. He is part of an, an American pantheon, an English pantheon. The characters in Hesiod's compilation are manifestly scientific and philosophical concepts. He says so. I mean, the ultimate conclusion is the transcendent categories of reason must be ascendant against self-interest and emotion. Self-interest and emotion are the, the traits of the titans on earth. The gods represent that which is higher. Paganism has no theological identity, no definition, no doctrine. It's because it's not a religion. There's no creator god. Remember, we're not talking about arranging pre-existing matter. I've been through the ancient texts um, in, in Egypt, uh, in Greece. There is not a whole lot of them around. Um, the, um, the pyramid texts, of course, have been preserved because they're indoors. But they don't have any heretics. Now, what we have outside of the pyramid texts are fragments. And they've always changed, as Ovid will, will tell you, depending on uh, social circumstance. But for a Roman Catholic, any change in doctrine is a step away from the truth. The concept of, of a god being real means something very different in an anomalous society, very crude, A equals A kind of society, as the ancient societies, are, quite frankly, were far more sophisticated intellectually than what we have today. So because we use religion and God in both cases, it's very easy to see them as one and the same thing. Um, let me quote uh, Swedenborg here. He says something very similar. Quote, the idolatries of nations in ancient times originated in a knowledge of correspondences, since all things visible on earth correspond, thus not only the trees, but all kinds of beasts and birds and fish and all other things. The ancients, who had a knowledge of correspondences, made for themselves images corresponding to heavenly things, and took delight in them because they signified such things as belonged to heaven and to the church. When the knowledge of correspondences had perished, their posterity, because these images and figures had been placed by the ancients near the temples, began to worship them as holy and finally as deities. In other words, only the most crude, that's the end of the quote, only the most crude would see it. I mean, I'm sure the simple people saw it, saw them as, as literal beings. Maybe some of them did. Correspondence in the way that Swedenborg is, is using the term, it means the rejection of nominalist ontology. Symbol is not the opposite of the substantial, it's gateway to the, the, the substantial. It's an expression of the outer contours of a platonic form. That's what these gods were. It was a way to express the forms, eternal truths, in human terms, in poetic terms, in terms that people can easily read about and like and understand. We go back to Gruber here, and this is the most important citation I have here. This is in his book on Plato, um, uh, Plato's Thought, actually, uh, page 150. He says the following, quote, By saying that love or victory is God, or to be more accurate, a God, was meant first and foremost that is more than human, not subject to death, everlasting. Any power, any force we see at work in the world which is not born with us and will continue after we are gone could thus be called a god, and most of them were. In this state of mind, and with this sensitivity to the superhuman character of many things that happen to us, which give us, it may be, stabs of joy or pain, which we don't understand, a Greek poet could write lines like, Recognition between friends is theos. But recognition between friends is God. It is a state of mind which obviously has no small bearing on this much discussed question of monotheism or polytheism in Plato, if indeed it does not rob the question of meaning altogether. End quote. Ruba is saying exactly what I'm arguing here. But his words have been forgotten in modern scholarship. The term theos today has absolutely no meaning since it's used for objects so different from one another. God in the Greek sense referred to any stable form of knowledge, any everlasting thing, that which is above and beyond physical chain. So Thales can refer to God as synonymous with the water archetype he's famed for theorizing about. Water is a God in a Greek sense, but certainly not in our sense. But we use the term God for both. That's absurd. The concept of paganism as a thing uh, may have a Christian origin. Um, a guy named Ryan Stone in the, uh, on the website Ancient Origins. This is what he says, quote, this effort of combining all non-Christian religions under one umbrella was, in fact, a clever strategy used by early Christians to remove the pagan face altogether. Using the Norse traditions as an example, the Vikings 
of the early medieval period had no true name for their religious following. In truth, the word religion would have been unknown, foreign term. The Nordic tribes preferred the word customs, as, like the Greeks and Romans, their rituals, beliefs, and traditions were undefined and fluidly interpreted, orally passed down rather than rigidly studied. There was no all-encompassing word for the belief in Asir of Anir and the various other beings and deities the ancient Norse worship. And there was no written text discussing their practices until the Christian author Sturlson wrote their mythology down in the 13th century. End quote. The concept is Christians, uh, they're missionaries, in order to make war on the belief systems that they were uh, evangelizing, had to give it this kind of, had to give it some kind of a, a, a veneer of unity. They needed an easier target to attack. So paganism uh, became almost a counter church. Almost all terms in theology here are, are anachronistic. Romans held that God ruled the earth in the same sense that the law of gravity rules downward velocity. That's what I'm trying to say here. Jupiter defined and symbolized the office of the emperor and was not a being in his own right. There's still history professors claiming that Romans thought the emperor was a god. Well, did anyone notice that the emperor died? That he made errors? Did anyone notice that this god could easily be overthrown? Are we to believe that the leadership of the Roman Empire, its senate, local nobles, elites, were incapable of noticing these things? Obviously, the term divine is not used in the same way. St. Paul uses the term. So how is it being used? The emperor was divine in the sense that his role as conqueror of chaos was a recapitulation of the architecture of natural law. The notion of a civilization was the opposite of chaos. The world never referred to any world as a technical term, never referred to everything in existence. But to talk about the world only referred to the civilized world that was comprehensible to those living in it. There's a, um, a work on Roman religion by um, uh, Wagenvoort. Um, let me cite it here. And this is yet another um, piece of evidence here. Quote, of the meaning of the word pious and pietas, Vesala says that the Romans meant the conduct of a man who performed all his duties towards the deity and his fellow human beings fully and in all respects. As pietas adversus deus, piety towards the gods. He goes on to say, the concept comes very close to religio, which gradually replaced it to such an extent that pietas came to denote in a more restricted sense the fulfillment of duty and virtuous behavior of men to one another, and particularly between blood relatives and relations by marriage, end quote. We have something else, though, in the Institutes of Gaius, we read this, quote, subject to divine right are res sacra and res religiosia. Sacra are those consecrated to the gods above, res religiosia to those dedicated to the gods below. That alone is considered sacrum, which has been consecrated under the authority of the Roman people, for instance, by Lex or Senatus Consultum, passed to that effect. On the other hand, a thing is made religiosum by the act of a private person when he buries a corpse in his own land, provided the dead man's funeral is his affair. In the provinces, however, the general opinion is that land does not become religiosum because the ownership of a provincial land belongs to the Roman people, to the emperor. Individuals only have possession of it and enjoyment of it. Still, it's not religious and is considered as such. Again, though a thing consecrated in the provinces otherwise than under the authority of the Roman people is not strictly sacred, it is nevertheless considered as such. Moreover, res sancte, such as the walls and gates of the city, are in a matter subject to divine right, end quote. Now, I know this is a very odd state, but he's defining religion, the sacred, as private property, or more accurately, the boundaries that people have set between plots. Um, and who are the gods below and the gods above? Uh, religiosum is the act of a private person burying a corpse in his own land? No, we're talking about, um, we're talking about boundary markers, and boundary markers had their own quote unquote God. Obviously we're not talking about sacred and religion and everything else in the sense that we use today. That is not how they use the term. It's not a religious concept. Now what is the emperor what is what is Gaius saying here? The sacred refers to the setting apart of something for a fundamentally definitive use. Sacred means set apart. That's all he's talking about here, plots of land. The Roman people are the arbiters of the sacred. That proves it's not a religious concept. Since revelation can't come from popular acclaim, something becomes religious becomes religious when a corpse is buried on the land. The land is then set aside for the purpose that has nothing to do with economics, farming, or any other mundane concern. The dead are those that make a mundane pursuit profitable at all, or possible at all. A religious object is one connected to the dead. Further, the veneration of the dead was identical to the veneration of tradition. The dead referred to a very real, practical link 
connecting the living to natural law, whose precepts tradition makes manifest. Now, let me clarify here what I'm trying to say. Um, the term sacred means set aside. This is what the, the, the early Roman law and even in the empire referred to as something as sacred, wanted to set aside for a specific purpose. Now, I quote the Institutes of Gaius, which is essential, of course, uh, because he mentions the burying of corpses on land. This is the setting aside of a plot, the burial of the dead. But the burial of the dead, you know, in a non nominalist society has an eternity of meaning. It's tradition. It's a link between the past and the present. The dead are never really dead. They're a part of us. Veneration of the dead is veneration of tradition. This is what they're referring to. It is a secular, naturalistic concept. The point I'm trying to make is that piety in the Roman Empire, religious ideas, were really the following of natural law, which, of course, has a superhuman origin. If natural law, but law exists, if eternal truths exist, then a lawgiver must exist that's capable of creating such things. Laws are not inherent in matter. They can't evolve. because They'd have to uh, evolve precisely at the same rate everything else in the cosmic ecosystem. The laws of evolution don't evolve. Sometimes the terms like uh, venerate are confused with, with worship. The latter is personal and places a deity in a position of manifest superiority. Somehow we're dependent on it in, in, a, in a radical way. Um, piety, religion, the sacred. This is about tradition and natural law. The fact that it gets personalized, and remember, boundary markers also had patron gods, the god of the boundary marker. All right. Obviously, we're not using God here in the sense that um, uh, a Christian will use when referring to Jesus or something like that. And so we're getting the impression here that we're using the term religion in two very, very different senses. And it's damaging how, um, how we view the ancient world. Paganism is not a religion. Paganism is a poetic and philosophical approach to the world. Uh, paganism doesn't confront Christianity. Paganism, you know, may confront Hegel or, or a poet of a different era, but it's not a religion. Plutarch is someone else who, um, who argued this uh, uh, pretty vehemently. He says the following, quote, The wiser of the priests call not only the Nile Osiris and the sea Trifon, they simply give the name of Osiris to the whole source and faculty creative of moisture, believing this to be the cause of generation and the substance of life-producing seed. The name of Typhon, uh, Typhon, I should say, they give to all that is dry, fiery, and arid, in general, uh, antagonistic to moisture, end quote. These aren't exactly liturgical or religious concepts. This is one of dozens of examples where Plutarch makes the argument that these gods were never meant to be seen as, as beings. They were symbols of tremendous social significance. To worship is essentially expressing your loyalty towards one's civilizational constitution. The human mind seems to have this, this drive to personalize everything. This is one of the reasons that monarchy is such a natural, um, uh, a natural form of government, because we personalize everything. Only in the modern era and only in the West are things apersonal, non-personal. In fact, the Western scientific establishment is eccentric in that it defines truth, or one, of the, one of the attributes of truth, is that it has nothing to do with personality. The minute you personalize something, it becomes myth. Let me give you another example. Uh, John West, uh, in his book on, um, on ancient Egypt, uh, the book, actually a very interesting book, uh, The Serpent in the Sky, The High Wisdom of Ancient Egypt, page 131. He says the following, quote, the image is concrete, bird, snake, dog, etc. And it represents a synthesis, a, com a complex of qualities, functions, and principles. Careful study of the symbols usually reveals the reason why the given symbol and not some other was chosen. For the bird represents the volatile, the spirit, the stork, which returns to its own nest. Migratory bird, par excellence, is the bird chosen for the soul. A serpent symbolizes duality and dualizing power. The dog symbolizes digestion. Given the dog's preferences for carrying over fresh meat, the choice of this symbol emphasizes that aspect of digestion, which is the transformation of dead matter into living matter. So Anubis opener of the way, resides over the deceased and takes part in the ritual of weighing of the heart. Death is not an end, it is a transformation, end quote. This is what the gods are. There is an eternal concept, a concept that all civilizations, that the human mind is already shaped and functioned to understand. It has to be because you find that every civilization that's ever exists. And the fact that they are given a personalized and poetic nature 
automatically means that they are mythical, religious, and hence false. These aren't gods that are worshipped uh, in the sense that Jesus is worshipped. They're not gods and they're not worshipped. They're given great veneration and respect, um, no different than any philosopher should give to the truth. Um, the book um, Symbol and Symbolic, Ancient Egypt, Science, and the Evolution of Consciousness. We read this, quote, In civilizations such as ancient Egypt, what we in our present presumptuousness call primitive animal worship was not a worship of the animal, but a consecration made the vital function which any animal particularly incarnates. It was not in reality worship. It was a meditation used to support and clarify an essential function of nature. That is to say, a meter, a god, so to speak. The Egyptians saw the jackal as incarnating certain characteristics, functions, processes of universal nature. The jackal is an animal that tears the flesh of its prey into pieces, which it buries and doesn't eat until they rot. From this real observed behavior, it becomes a symbol for both metaphysical and physical process digestion, end quote. So here you have the evidence. These gods aren't gone. They were never meant to be seen as actual beings floating in the sky somewhere. The gods are functional types. They're summarizing, synthesizing qualities in a set of symbols coming from observation and experience. They're personalized and poeticized because it's the most efficient way of transmitting this knowledge. So the human soul is seen as a, as a bird with a human head. Most historians will assume that the Egyptians believed the soul was therefore a bird with a man's head attached. And I've been in lecture halls. I, I mentioned this example because um, I've actually heard a lecture uh, where a historian whose name I won't, uh, I think he's dead now, said, yes, the Egyptians um, believed that the soul, the essence of the human being, was a bird uh, and it had a man's head attached to it. That's how they, that's how they saw it. That's what they believed was true about the soul. They believed this is actually something that they thought was literally true. The belief in literal set of gods would force this conclusion. Rubus says the following, quote, by this anthropomorphism, though it certainly affected the popular conception of the divinities, was to the educated Greek at least purely symbolic, end quote. In other words, all she's talking about is this anthropomorphic uh, approach to things is simply to take an eternal truth, it could be mathematical or political or scientific of some kind, something that, that, that is eternal, something that's, that's part of natural law, and giving it a poetic persona. Um, the, the Egyptian god, the sun god Ra, was the supreme solar god. Now, you know you, know you have professors on, on, a, on a semesterly basis saying that the Egyptians believed that the sun was um, uh, in a solar boat and it traveled across the sky every day to the realms of the underworld each night. Uh, this is what they thought happened. Now, maybe the simple people may have believed that, but the elite certainly didn't. It was just a way to comprehend the fundamentals of astronomy in a way that avoided the dryness of expository prose. It's exoteric rather than esoteric. The problem that we have, broader point that I'm trying to get across here, is that historians and universities are exclusively secular. They're almost all liberal in a broad sense of the term. And it means that they have very little first-hand knowledge of what it's like to believe anything. What does it mean to worship the sun? Was the sun a person? The sun was never worshipped. It was simply a reminder that the, the, the forces of natural law and God are everywhere. It's a symbol for the royal crown, and hence it's victory over chaos. It's good order. It's justice. They didn't worship the sun. No one worshipped the sun. They worshipped what it stood for. And we do too. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing religious about that. But what did the term worship mean? I'm, I'm shocked to find out that there's not tons of literature on this. What, did, what, what does it mean when an ancient writer... Um, said that uh, the Egyptian people worshipped X. Most secular historians have no idea what it's like to worship anything. So they use the words in the vaguest sense possible. And their audience is other secular historians. It's not a huge problem. It doesn't come up. Worship in these stories seems to be faithful obedience, not personal devotion. Cosmic harmony, for example. It's not an inherently religious notion, but it was a scientific and metaphysical idea. So in the time of the pharaohs, the idea of mat, M-A, apostrophe, A-T, was his cosmic harmony and justice, but it's also depicted as a goddess. Justice, justice is a mere personification in Mott. The personalized abstraction is an important means of communicating its content. Mott bound all good actions into a transcendent conception of good. It's a platonic form, not a person. Mott is a daughter of the sun and the moon. No one believed the sun and the moon copulated and created this Mott character. It's nonsense, but historians have been saying this for centuries. 
what it means, and the only possible thing it could mean, is that good order comes from both reason, the sun, and feeling, the moon, the male and the female. It's a communitarian concept, not a literal story, but an actual personality. The pharaoh did not believe that the sun and the moon had sex. Cosmic harmony can be approached by reason, and it's a product of universal reason. Such a thing has to be depicted in accessible and personalized terms. Being the daughter of the moon goddess simply means that the cosmos is also based on harmony. The cooperation between man and woman is based in the family. Theory um, uh, Benderitter uh, says he actually, uh, an article on, on Mat, the, the Egyptian word for order, also a goddess. He says the following, quote, Mat is at the heart of understanding Egyptian civilization in its entirety and is the foundation of its longevity. It is bound to and confused with ethics, including justice and truth, with universal order, cosmic order, social order, political order, and with social integration based on a communication and confidence. The foundation of Egyptian cultural identity, Mat is a great creation of the thinkers of the Old Kingdom. It is she who ultimately offers an ideological setting to the pharaonic state, both at the level of justification of its existence and that of the rules which define good government. They didn't believe that Mat was a person. To talk about this cosmic order and to define it that way it is the equivalent of um, symbolizing uh, liberty with the bell in Philadelphia. You don't worship it, although in their minds, apparently that's what we do. Same thing with the Statue of Liberty or anything like that. Patriotic sites and symbols come complete with rituals and things that smack a religion but are not. But this is how human beings, universally and without exception, show respect to foundational truths. This is what religion, quote-unquote, is in the ancient world. Gods are not real being. This is what makes Christianity completely different. Uh, the Israelite religion, Yahweh, completely different. These were real people. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they actually exist as real people. They're not symbols of anything. You can think of them that way. That doesn't take away the fact that they're actually people. Um, and it's odd because we just want to say uh, that, that the, uh, the typical ancient uh, you know, man living in Athens um, worshipped Zeus in the same sense that um, a man in 19th century London uh, worshipped God, God the Father. They had nothing in common. Those relationships had absolutely nothing in common in a theological sense whatsoever. And because of that stupidity and sloppy thinking coming from exclusively secular historians, we have a lot of problems. There is no such thing as paganism. There is no theology of paganism. This is not a theology. It's a naturalistic conception of things, as Grubus said, a conception of the eternal truths. And every civilization manifests the eternal truths a bit differently. Our natural law, uh, you know, there is only one human nature. Our minds are uh, created by God to um, express the truth and to receive this truth. It's unnatural, so to speak, to speak a lie. The mind wasn't made for that. The, the, the speech uh, uh, vocal cords weren't made for that. They were made for communicating, creating community, and therefore expressing humility and truth. As I've already said, the, the most obnoxious aspect of this is the belief that the Roman emperor was seen as God. You know, it's still, I mean, even as an undergraduate, I said this can't be true. He died. Um, there's an excellent work out uh, on the matter of the gods by Clifford Ando. Um, and he's making a very similar argument to me uh, concerning the, the emperor. Um, and let me, let me quote it to you. It's a little long, but, but bear with me here. Quote, unwillingness to countenance the scale of divine potentialities that included both Augustus and Christ can only impede attempts to understand the foreign thought world of the ancient Mediterranean. We must understand how Vitruvius could, could believe that both Augustus and God had divine minds. As with any traditional deity, the emperor's divinity implied neither moral perfection nor true omnipotence. And with, with Virgil, many probably understood that the emperor's animus was in many ways constrained by the morality of the body, mortality of the body. Neander did not suggest that the emperor himself controlled the weather, rather that men should pray to the gods for the emperor's safety because his special blessedness positioned him to mediate between the divine and mortal. When Aristides wrote that the mere mention of the emperor's name caused men to rise in a single breath, pray to the gods on the emperor's behalf, and to the emperor for his own affairs, he participated in the same theological position. The emperor's exalted position allowed him to exercise godlike power over mortal men, even as it prevented him from receiving aid, save for the god. End quote. So he's exasperated with, with how uh, this, this prejudice continues to exist. 
To call the emperor a god only means that he was in union with the archetype, natural law that led some men to carve out empires in the wilderness. The world was in everything. When you use the word world, you see it even in liturgical texts. When Rome civilized the whole world, it says. They don't mean everything. The world was Roman civilization. Uh, the cosmos wouldn't mean everything. So for the emperor to rule the world meant to rule the expansion of Rome and her possessions that followed the natural order. Believe it or not, there are well-paid professors of history who believe that the Romans were so primitive that they didn't realize that there was a world outside Rome. Ando was seeking to protect the innocence of these historians. You know, um, more than anything else, this example of, of the emperor's God shows how terms like God and worship have no relation to our modern understanding of the terms and how this is the deal. There has to be a new vocabulary here. Um, there was a paper from a student. Uh, I quote it. Let me, um, let me quote it here. Quote, in order for the Roman people to be open to the idea of the emperor worship, the imperial cult had to appear to develop spontaneously as a unique Roman institution. Augustus began a religious revival to restore the Republic from the Civil War. This also served to explicitly link Augustus to the well-being of the Roman society. Through the use of religion, politics, and propaganda, Augustus managed to establish an imperial cult that recognized his divine divinity upon her. He modified the conception of genius, which resembled the living spirit that was present in all living things, people, and gods. Augustus adopted, adopted the worship of his genius as a way for the public to unofficially worship his potential divinity. The worship of Augustus' as genius did not make Augustus divine, but was a way to publicly acknowledge the spirit of the emperor. Sources tell us that Augustus decreed that a libation should be poured forth to his genius at every banquet. End quote. That is the most confused thing I've read in a long time. All this person is saying, the virtues of the emperor are tightly bound to the fortunes of the empire. Well, that's not interesting. Of course it is. In this work, the author refuses to define words like divine or genius. So you're dumber from reading that statement as you were before. Calling Octavian Theos is proof of the thesis here. The term didn't mean God in any modern Christian or Islamic sense. It was merely his spirit that all living things possessed. Alexander being a son of Zeus is not a claim that his mother was impregnated by the paternal archetype, which the author, by the way, implies. It means that the emperor's job was to conquer chaos and disorder as Zeus himself did. The terms divine and worship are misleading and very confusing. You have historians like uh, Ramsey um, writing in uh, the turn of the century. He says, he says this, and again, this, this confusion really has reached absurd uh, proportions. I'm a historian who's actually very well known. Quote, in no part of the world was there such fervent and sincere loyalty to the emperor as in Asia. Augustus had been a savior to the Asian peoples, and they deified him as a savior of mankind and worshipped him with the most wholehearted devotion as a present deity. End quote. This description is absolutely ludicrous if we use the terms in the sense we use the terms normally. Many people are saviors. Great generals can take victory from the hands of defeat. They're gods in that sense. They're gods in the sense that they have shown manifest powers to save a society uh, that might have been defeated otherwise. This is what the term meant at the time. Lord and God, this was allegedly Domitian's title, meaning the exact same thing. By this argument, the landlord is a divine being. The Greek tyrant was an illegitimate authoritarian ruler, and a temple was primarily a place of worship. I mean, this is what's being passed uh, for history here. The confusion of word meanings over time has made understanding of the ancient world almost impossible. Now, there are some correctives here. But this is extremely important to understand. Um, George Washington is a god and savior to Americans in this sense. Using terms like God has to end, it creates confusion. Uh, that while it might occasionally be funny, it harms our understanding of ancient history. But it does serve the interests of modernity because they love to argue that you don't know if, if, if God is there or is true because there were millions and millions of gods in the ancient world. So the argument goes, he was only one of millions. This is far from true. Yahweh was completely alone as a creator and sustainer ex nihilo. Creator gods, in a true sense, were architects, symbols of order and number in the world, not creators. Roman and Mesopotamian societies had no concept of zero, so ex nihilo creation was not a conceptual option. Creator gods were worshipped in the same sense that a philosopher honors truth or objectivity. The ancients had rites and festivals celebrating this. It makes it no more a religion than, than deadheads following Jerry Garcia around. It serves the interest also of modernity because it permits moderns to see themselves as a pinnacle of progress. Only the ignorant ancients worship gods. We don't worship the state as a god. To argue that these gods were archetypes made into relatable, personalized beings shows them to be far more sophisticated than the Enlightenment uh, ever gave them credit for. Okay, I think I've made my point here. 
Um, sloppy reasoning has equated Yahweh or Allah on the one hand with Hermes and Poseidon on the other. Stories of the ancient myths show these beings acting in very human ways. They're not seen as gods in the normal sense. St. Peter writes in his second epistle, quote, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus, Christ in power. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, end quote. So he's explicitly distinguishing the Christian faith from mere analogies of the Romans surrounding him. The ancient myths are poetic tales that gave a human face to natural forces. To understand, people have to make the subject matter about them, to give it a human personality. Most people struggle with abstraction or devotion or hatred, whatever, can only be directed at a person, not an abstraction. The emperors of Rome were not worshipped as gods. The relationship that they're using that, that term, God, to refer to Yahweh, what to refer to, to permission, is absolutely absurd. The modern scholars are secular. They just take the present ideas of God or religion and impose it on the ancients. Any ritual action whatsoever is called religious. Any being with some supernatural power is called divine. Hestia did not think of himself as a revealer of divine truth. Terms such as God in referring to, you know, uh, Zeus or Hera, they need to be removed from students in the classical world. Religion has to be defined with far greater rigor. As Eric Clapton fans literally do not see him as God, neither did the ancients see Zeus. Furthermore, and this is very important, in removing paganism from the realm of religion, it means that Christians can see the beauty and the truth encoded in these myths, rather than seeing, rather than seeing them as a demonic set of tricks. Myths were secular in our sense. They are naturalistic in our sense. They're never religious. Pagans don't argue with Christians. That doesn't make sense. Um, paganism is not a religion. There is no doctrine. They can't argue with Christians in that sense. And I'm still waiting for a definition of pagan, and there is none that exists. And I believe the, the author that I quoted before, that this was kind of a, a convenient um, uh, thing that missionaries uh, created to give them something to oppose. And so they created this, this unified entity, which of course never really existed. The terms used in Northern Europe were simply native customs. That's what St. Uh, Gregory the Great said to uh, St. Augustine of Canterbury. He didn't say, you know, keep pagan. He said just maintain native customs. That's what he referred to them as. These were not seen as religions even then. And yet now, sloppy reasoning and, and secular uh, historical elite has led us to these absurdities. When they really will tell you that Greeks, even though they could see Mount Olympus from their house, Believe that there were gods up there. It's ridiculous. Paganism is a form of poetry, of, of artistry, even of ontology, but certainly not religion. Thank you. I'll talk to you next time.